Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the Live Fit Now podcast. I hope you're all well. Thank you for joining me today. Once again, I cannot wait for you to listen to today's conversation. This is a conversation that is for everybody. Without doubt, we can all take something home from today's episode. In those moments of need, when we're not quite sure what to do, we have a few basic tips of first aid knowledge and also why you might want to think about taking a first aid course. Today's conversation is with a very lovely, very knowledgeable lady with lots of experience, not only in her field, but also in life. So I can't wait for you to listen. Without further ado, here is the conversation. My guest today is a professional teacher with an instinctive ability to make learning first aid memorable and enjoyable. She has over 15 years of hands-on first aid experience, both as a global expedition leader and as a parent. She draws from this to bring first aid to life for participants, providing practical training grounded in realistic examples of how the techniques could be used. She also has over 10 years of experience as a teacher in the classroom, which comes through in her clear, memorable approach to teaching first aid. She enjoys helping participants gain confidence to feel that they could step forward to help in an emergency if needed, and the self-belief that they would be able to do something to help and make a big difference. Welcome to the Live Fit Now podcast, Louise Walsley. Thank you for joining me today. <laughs> Thank you. It's funny hearing that back. I was like, oh, yes, I wrote that. How nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I really would just love to start by you telling us a little bit more about yourself and, and how you've reached this point in your career. So I started out as a geography teacher in a secondary school. I loved teaching. I hated all of the marking parents evenings you know paperwork that goes sadly with teaching um, and I love traveling and I had these long summer holidays where I um, had no friends to play with because they were all working um, I was being paid very little so I didn't have any sort of spare cash to go on lots of pants holidays so I discovered as long as I had a bunch of kids in tow I could get paid to go traveling so I spent the five years that I was teaching I spent those five summer holidays um, going overseas um, with a group of teenagers, running personal development expeditions. So a lot in South America, a lot in Asia, a bit in Africa, and um, absolutely loved it to the point where I'd been to teaching and became an expedition leader for eight years. So I started out with the uh, school groups and then uh, rapidly moved to adults. They look after themselves a bit better, it's a bit easier and uh, have a bit more fun. Um, especially the charity groups. We ever had those um, begging emails that say, um, you know, sponsor me to climb Kilimanjaro or yeah. you know, walk the trail next. So I was um, leading those groups for the charities and they were wonderful. Such a lovely bunch of people who were all very much in it together. But inevitably over all of those years, um, a lot of first aid incidents happened, um, people got ill, and as the expedition leader, I had to deal with it. So um, that is where my first aid experience comes from. It's very much hands-on, practical, something's happened, I have to deal with it. So, um, you know, it's not hospitals, you know, sterile environments and medical professionals, it's, you know, it's what first aid is about. Um, so I set up Wesley Training, started um, teaching first aid when I sort of got to the point in my life where it was time to settle down and um, have you know, a family. And I can't be traveling around the world continuously. So I used my teaching background to um, enable everybody, well, as many people as I possibly can, um, to learn the basics of first aid. And it's a lot of it is about confidence. So I teach adults and children. Um, so I say as soon as they can recognize the number nine, I can teach them something. So, you know, four-year-olds can learn 999, they can make a ball, and um, they can potentially save a life. So that's my aim. That's wonderful. Do you think all of us could benefit from taking a first aid course. Do you think we, most of us lack the, the basic knowledge, not just confidence, but actually having no idea what to do in an emergency? Very much so. I, um, knowledge brings confidence, but most uh, first aid is actually common sense. 
So even if you haven't done a course recently and you kind of go, oh, but if someone was choking, what would I do? And I'm like, well, what would you do? And they're like, well, I'd slap them on the back. That is exactly what you need to do. So I just aim to get across that nearly always doing something is better than doing nothing in every single situation. And also, as soon as you feel uncomfortable with the situation, as soon as you kind of go, oh, that's just a little bit, is, is that bad or is that not? Just call 999, you know, long live the NHS. We can make a call, they'll arrive, they'll do something or maybe not even do something because it's needed. But um, the first aid is that bit in between, you know, staying with them, um, emotional care, just talking to them, um, holding their hand, stroking their hair, whatever it is to make them feel better. Um, even more so if they're unconscious, you know, because you think you don't do it so naturally. But um, the reason you talk to people in comas, you know, hearing is the last sense to go. So um, just being that person who is calmly supporting them and, you know, looking after them while waiting for the experts to actually come and diagnose what's wrong is still vital first aid. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what do you cover within first aid? And will we, are we only talking serious emergencies, lots of blood, not being able to breathe, or is there actually a real base level that actually we probably come into contact with quite regularly, but perhaps don't know or don't do anything about? Mm. Sadly, time is what dictates what we cover. So, you know, time is such a precious resource that a lot of people say, oh, I can only, you know, come for two hours or four hours or even one day. You know, if I had a week, I could teach you absolutely everything. We could do lots of practical scenarios to, you know, massively actually embed all that knowledge. But um, sadly, that's never the case. So um, if it is a short course, then it is the emergency stuff, because actually that's what people want to know, you know they're unconscious or they're not breathing or they're seriously bleeding or they're choking, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, the last couple of hours of a one day course, you can start getting into more of the everyday stuff. So um, the, you know, the maybe splinters or burns or, um, you know, the, the smaller cuts and grazes. Um, and it, also the sort of when to worry. So, um, you know, I have, two small children so head injuries is just something that kind of happens and a lot of people are like well that's scary I'm like well it might be scary but it might not so having the time to actually talk through different scenarios is actually really really useful yeah I guess it's first aid is the first port of call without having to go to a professional it's knowing what to do without having to phone 999 or phone your doctors or go to the pharmacy mm. So it's just that initial response. And the response could be instantly calling 999. It could be, um, you know, if it's something like you can see some blood, please put some pressure on it. Um, you know, if they're choking, please slap them on the back. You know, if you need to send someone to run and get the defibrillator, it's, it's that initial response. So most of the time people think of the emergency stuff, but it could easily be just calming them down. Um, you know, if someone's having an asthma attack, what is it that has tricked that and taking them away from that situation? So it could be, you know, the pollen that's been a really bad hay fever season this year. And so um, it could be just getting them inside. It could be, you know, the cold air getting them inside. It could be the, you know, I don't know, the dust mites from inside. You need to get them outside. So it doesn't have to be, um, you know, requiring lots of kits or lots of expertise. As I said before, a lot of it's just common sense. So, um, but going on a course um, and, you know, learning a bit more is what gives you the confidence to then be able to say, yeah, I am doing the right thing. They're going to be okay. Yeah, it's interesting. From what you were just saying, it sounds like a big part of it is actually being able to assess the situation, assess the environment to know and read what's going on as to how to act or not to act. So as first aiders, I always say we assess everything, we diagnose nothing. So the medical professionals with their years of training, they do the diagnosis. They're the ones who say why they've gone unconscious, for instance. Um, as the first aiders, we need to just gather as many clues as possible. So, you know, are they conscious? Are they not? Are they breathing? Are they not? Are they bleeding? Are they not? You know, 
do they have a medical history? So like talking to their family or friends, um, looking on their, um, if you've got a smartphone, if you filled in the medical ID bit on your smartphone, and that will say if you've got any allergies or any medication. Some people wear medical alerts, so like a, a necklace or a bracelet that will say, or have a wallet, they have a um, card in their wallet yeah. um, that will say whether they have any um, conditions. So that is all still first aid, is gathering all that information. And so when the medical professionals arrive, you can say, you know, this is their breathing rate, this is their medical history, um, without ever having to diagnose anything, really. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, I'm just going to bring it back up because I've never heard of it before, which I'm, is not so a good thing. Um, but the medical ID on the on your mobile phone is that something you can access without having to go into the phone? I assume there must be some special way of getting to that without the person opening it. <laughs> Very much so. So this is what I teach the kids a lot um, because you know, especially until they have their own phone, um, if they had to call 999, they need to be able to access a, a mobile. I mean, most of them, if it's their parents, they know the codes to get in, obviously. Um, but if it was me who was unconscious and my phone was in my back pocket, they, they don't obviously know my pin code, but they can grab it. They, if you just keep swiping and pressing buttons, then you'll get the, the key pad, you know, the uh, pin code screen come up. And then at the bottom left hand corner of that, there is a button that says um, emergency or emergency call. And so if you press on that, um, it bypasses the um, pin code and a normal uh, keypad will pop up and that's where you can call 999. And then if you fill it in, uh, it's on that screen where, again, it's normally, I think, bottom left hand corner, it's a, um, it's either it says medical ID or it's a little red um, head and you press on that, and then any information that you want the um, experts to know, you can put in there. So you, you put in your name, put in your age, you put in any allergies, medication, you could put in um, your date of birth, put in your next of kin, so who do you want them to call, and that is all there. So in order to fill it in, um, if you've got an iPhone, um, there's a health app, um, you might know this from your, your industry, um, it's like a little red heart and um, if you click on that and then swipe along the bottom it says um, I think it's medical ID it's something like that um, if you've got uh, Android you have to go to contacts and then my um, and you could fill it in there but yeah I always implore everybody to fill that in yeah. because yeah. It, it, it can be accessed um, so they can't get into your uh, like contacts and your details. No. So the ICE numbers a few years ago in case of yeah. emergency. So we're all um, encouraged to put one or two um, ICE numbers into our contacts. But then with smartphones, everybody locks their phone with a pin code yeah. or a face ID or whatever it is. Um, so you could get to those, which is why actually completing the medical ID is so important. Oh, I've never heard of that before. I'm not sure whether that's me or <laughs> I'm hoping that everyone else gives that. Oh, I've not heard of this. It's a really great, um, great way to have some information on our phones. Even if you haven't got anything particularly, uh, any particular medical issues, even just having those basic contact details is really helpful, isn't it? But it's also useful to say, um, you know, when it says any medical conditions, none. Yeah. So, um, you know, if I find you and you're having a seizure, my first thought would be, do you have epilepsy? Is you know, is it this your first seizure? Have, are you prone to seizures? Are you on medication for seizures? So if I go into your phone and it says none, then I know that this is your first seizure. This is definitely emergency. Get the get experts in straight away. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Already a wonderful tip for us to take home. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'd like to ask you. I mean, did did you have a pivotal moment that led you to going down this path? Or did you just feel drawn towards wanting to teach people again and thinking empowering people with such useful skills was, was the right way to go? So I've always been a teacher, you know, ever since apparently my, like some of my primary school reports and when, and it's funny actually seeing my daughter now who's six and she's exactly the same as me and she'll just get everybody together and she'll start, you know, and um, that's always who I've been. I love teaching. And as I said, the, I would still be teaching geography happily um, in a school if that's all I had to do. And, but sadly it is about a third of your time. The rest of the time is all the, um, yeah, all the marking and everything, which is just 
dire. Mm. So, um, you know, I, it's, it's something that comes very naturally to me and it's something that I enjoy. It, it is my sort of, um, I don't know, raison d'etre, I suppose. And uh, so finding something that I could teach that was worthwhile, that I had um, practical experience of, um, I, you know, I don't want to just learn something in a book and then feel like I can go and teach it. Um, and there's a whole uh, another aspect of first aid, the mental health first aid, which a lot of people are um, teaching now, which is amazing. But I'm not going to do that because I am not so genuine about it. You know, I, what um, my strap line is bringing first aid to life, and that is because I. In my courses, I throw in all sorts of stories, either from my days of tour leading or from just being a mum, you know, what my kids are up to if I'm teaching a lot of pediatric courses. And I feel that is really helpful for people to learn. Well, actually, when I saw someone having a seizure, this is what I did about it, you know. And so that's the sort of thing that is far more memorable. So um, with first aid, it is a skill for life. It's something that I passionately believe everybody should just, just know the basics. We don't need to know open heart surgery. We just need to know that, okay, they're bleeding, let's put pressure on it. You know, they're choking, let's slap them back. It's, it's quite simple. Well, I see it's simple, but you know, common sense rather than simple. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a great subject to teach. Um, but also as a business, you know, it's a lot of people need it for their insurance um, if they are um, in business. But also um, I teach a lot of new parents. You know, you, you have your baby, you come out of hospital, you get home and you just suddenly feel this ridiculous level of responsibility for this thing and you just don't know what to do. And so um, you're just giving them... I sort of break it all down to make it as simple and as memorable as possible. And that's actually where my teaching background really helps. And, um, and also lots of practicals, because if you do it on a mannequin, you know, this bit of plastic, just give it a go, then um, you can get it wrong as many times as you need to, but then you get it right and then it sinks in. So um, I think it's, it's a great subject to teach for all of those reasons. And so, yeah, I started, um, 13 years ago and then um, set up Worsley Training eight years ago um, when my first was born and actually freelancing wasn't worthwhile. Um, so yeah, I love it. And this, this is me for life now. <laughs> oh, I love it. The fact you found, found your calling and just to give a, a rough idea, what, how many courses do you offer? How many lengths of course, like what's the shortest you offer? What's the longest you offer? So the, it depends whether you need it to be accredited or not. So, um, you know, if people need like the tick in the box first aid certificate, I always hope that it's not just a tick in the box. Actually, they, they learn a lot and they gain a lot as well for life skills. But if it is just that, the, um, the minimum number of hours is four. So the basic life support course, which is four hours, um, then that goes up to the emergency first aid at work, which is one day. And then um, there's various two-day courses, a bit more specialist. So there's um, pediatric first aid is two days, um, outdoor first aid is two days, and then there's the first aid work that's three days. If you don't need it to be accredited, um, so all the courses that I teach to children, um, you know, give me half an hour, I can teach them something. Um, preferably for, um, for uh, primary schools and, um, you know, anything for secondary schools can you know half a day is absolutely fine as well so um depending on the amount of time i'm given i go into a lot of schools um and wonderfully from september um first aid is on the curriculum the phse curriculum for primary schools and secondary schools mm. and so what i love doing especially with primary schools is going in for a day um, if they have seven year groups and they have um, seven you know, lessons in a day. I teach one age appropriate topic to every year group um, for that day. And then they go back the following year and we do a quick revision of what you know, we taught last year and then we go to the next age appropriate topic. So by the time they leave at the end of year six, um, you know, they've potentially had six sessions from me. Um, with revision on each one and so you know they are I call them mini lifesavers they're, they're brilliant 
with the secondary schools, um, I call them my teenagers, and um, that can either be done as a, you know, sort of three hours or so with one year group, so quite often after exams or that kind of thing. Um, or likewise, I can do one session um, in a day, but they tend to have, I know it's like stricter curriculum, so they're a bit more busy and um, trying to like blank out a day and they just miss some English lesson or something. It doesn't go down quite so well. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic that it's being made part of the, the primary curriculum. That's a big step forward, isn't it? There's been a lot of campaigning by um, a lot of very influential organisations, we say, um, to make it happen. And um, my only uh, hope now is, you know, you could tick that box just by, you know, putting on a video. And we, yeah, yeah, we showed them a video, off they go. I'm like, no, please don't do that. It's a practical subject. You know, either... Um, I've been doing a couple of little train the trainers to teach the um, either the PHSE coordinator or the first aider in school to say, right, this is how you teach the session. Um, and, you know, there's various grants to get a, you know, a, a load of mannequins for the school um, or you can hire them or even just, you know, bandages and things. There's a lot of practicals that they can do on each other. But it is a practical subject. So even if they haven't got the budget to get someone like me in, then um, at least, yeah, make sure it's taught properly to make yes. it, yeah. Well, it really does have to be practical, doesn't it? It's, you have to blend all these different learning styles together because one, one size does not fit all, but the one that probably fits best is getting in and doing it. I, it's likewise with my job and I'm trying to teach people to lift weights. I might show them so they can see, but that doesn't necessarily mean until they do it, they can copy. And then once they start doing it, they can start moving and tweaking and you can see, oh, is it hurting there? You know, can you feel it there? And then it develops. And that's how we learn best, isn't it? Getting yeah. stuck in and well, we remember. Kinesthetic learning, which is the, the learning by doing, yeah. um, is, you know, always the, the aim. Um, there are visual learners, though, so you still do need to go through the, you know, I do have PowerPoints, but it's definitely not like loads of bullet points with loads of words most of the time it's just an image you know i'm talking about a blocked airway yeah. um you know i have an image of a sort of cross section through her head so you can see how big the tongue is and you know you can understand that when you lie on your back and you're unconscious that tongue blocks the airway and um they can see that much better by seeing an image but then the actual doing practical bit is right therefore we open an airway you know by tilting the head back and yeah yeah, it's great. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is always a big one. I think you might have a few for yours. Um, are there any common myths that you would like to debunk? <laughs> <laughs> Where do I start? It's always actually quite fun. I'm like, so who's heard of this or who thinks this? And um, it's, it's old wives' tales. Um, so there are always quite a few. Um, burns always full of them the really old wives tales you know putting butter on a burn or anything like that did we heard that like no you know if it's a heat burn the skin is so hot that if you put butter on it it's just going to melt and actually make it worse but um the main one people think of is to run it under the cold tap yeah but you need to hold it under the tap for at least 10 minutes up to 20 minutes these days and you cannot hold any part of your body under a cold tap for 20 minutes. You'd have hypothermia, it would all be, it'll just be horrendous. A cool tap. So the ideal is a, um, a mixer tap, you know, if you've got it over your um, kitchen sink or even a shower, um, have the cold tap on fully, but put the um, hot tap on a little bit as well so that it's cool water. As long as the water is cooler than the, your skin that you've burnt, then it's going to draw all the heat energy out um, and that will work. So that's always a classic one. Um, what other ones? Uh, removing um, ticks or um, bee stings with tweezers is another no-no. Because um, so a bee will leave their sting um, in your skin and the sting is a little tube and the venom is inside that um, tube. It's the same with ticks, you know, they're stuck in your, um, your skin. And if you squeeze them, they will actually just sort of regurgitate into your skin and things like that. Lovely. <laughs> so um, exactly, tweezers are bad. They're good for pulling splinters out, but nothing else. 
Um, so if it's a bee sting, you need to scrape it. So, um, you know, a nail or a credit card or something just to scrape it sideways like that, and that will pop it out without releasing the venom. Um, with a tick, please get um, some kind of tick removal tool. Um, I have, it's called Otom Tick Twister. There's lots of other <laughs> makes available, obviously, but that's what I like. Um, it's like a little um, sort of two-pronged fork almost, and you um, get it right in against the skin, and then you just twist it and lift it out, and then all the head and the legs and everything come out um, without upsetting it so much that it will be sick. So that's, uh, that's always a good one. Um, what else? Um, if someone chops off a finger by mistake, mm -hmm. grim, amputations, <laughs> um, instantly people would think, put it on ice. But you have, um, not only do you sort of cut off the limb, you've cut off its blood supply and therefore its oxygen supply. And so it is dying, but if you put it on ice, you will freeze it. And then that will obviously completely render um, any reattachment completely, it's not gonna happen. So um, it wants to be cool, but not frozen. So wrap it in a little bit of plastic first to make it sterile and then put a little bit of fabric around it, which could just be a sock or a glove or a scarf. It doesn't have to be a you know, sterile first aid bandage. Um, and then have some ice. And the ice could be your frozen peas. It could be a, um, you know, an ice pack, it could be a wine bottle cooler. I don't care. Something that's cool, but make sure it's not in contact with the skin. Right. That'll actually give you a cold burn and, um, and that'll be a bad one. And the last one I noticed, I noted, noted um, is if someone's having a seizure. Um, again, in the olden days, they used to um, believe that if you put something in their mouth, then um, that would stop them biting their tongue. Um, all they will do, when you're having a seizure, you're so strong, you know, all of your muscles are really strong, you will bite through whatever's put in their mouth. Leather was a, a popular thought, you know, like a shoe or something, they'd actually, um, or I don't know, a spoon or something, they could bite through that and that would actually block their airway and make obviously everything a lot worse. So um, we always say, do not restrain them. Do not put anything in their mouths. Um, with a seizure, the key thing is just to sort of clear the area to stop them hurting themselves, to clear other people away, because it's, you know, it's all a bit embarrassing. Um, and then kind of let them get on with it. Note the time, that's the one that always people forget. But you know, if you are having a seizure, it's very key to know, was it, 30 seconds, was it five minutes? Um, if it's the first one you've seen, it probably always will feel like it was forever, but it might yeah. only be a minute or two. So um, yeah, the, the myth to debunk is don't restrain them and don't put anything in their mouth. Clear so, the space and call 999, I guess. Clear the space, yeah, Got it. yeah straight on, yeah. yeah. Keep them safe. Uh, I, I kind of have not brought this up already, but should we all have a well-stocked and in-date first aid kit at home? <laughs> Um, yes, but I also know it's realistic to say that I'm sure loads of people don't. Um, at the end of my courses, I say, you know, you don't need to go out and spend an absolute fortune, but based on the skills and the knowledge that I've now given you, what kit would you like to have to hand? Um, so in my handbag that I carry around all the time, I have a face shield and a pair of gloves because I'd hate that to be the reason that I couldn't help. So, you know, if someone was bleeding massively and um, I wanted to go and help, but I had nothing I could use as a barrier, then um, I'd still call 999, I'd still stay with them, but I wouldn't have to, you know, put my hand, potentially, you know, get infected with any blood or viruses they might have if I didn't know them. Um, in the car, I have another, you know, facial and set gloves, um, and also a few bandages and dressings and things. And then I have my full kit at home. Um, I'm also the queen of improvisation though. So for my exhibition leading days, I obviously don't want to carry a hospital up a mountain on my back. So, um, you can improvise with a lot of stuff. It doesn't, a lot of the time, it doesn't need to be sterile. So, you know, the most common thing people arrive into any &E with, with a bleed, is a tea towel. You know, it's about grabbing a bit of material, or if you've got babies, you've probably got muslins everywhere, you know, it's just grabbing a bit of material to put pressure on that bleed. And, um, you know, you're not worried that it's, oh, it's got to be something out of first aid kit. No, you know, we can improvise with a lot of things. Um, so, yes, ideally, we will have 
well-stocked first aid kits. Um, but if you don't, then, you know, improvise, exactly. I have a dog, so I have dog poo bags in every, you know, jacket pocket and things. So if I didn't have any gloves, I could just still create, a, it just needs to be a plastic barrier between, you know, their fluids and you. Um, so I'd use a dog poo bag and I'd put pressure on that wound using that. Obviously gloves are better, but yeah. if that's all you've got, then, um, then go for it. Oh, that's great that's actually important isn't it it's important to actually keep yourself safe first and i guess the thing is as you say obviously sterile is ideal but actually a wound can get cleaned once you've got to medical care so it's, it's more important to take action that than not so there's sort of two different levels of wounds there's the ones that you know the bleeding is the main concern and then there's the ones that aren't really bleeding um, and therefore it's the infect infection that's the main concern. Um, I would say that, you know, the skin is a wonderful organ. It keeps the outside world out and us in. As soon as you make a hole in it, you're either letting us out, you know, it's bleeding profusely, or you're letting the outside world in and it's getting infected. So the sort of first aid response um, is determined by what kind of wound it is and which is your primary concern. If it is just bleeding loads, there's no way infection well, there is a way of actually going, but it, you know, your, your concern is, is the blood. It's sort of self-cleaning itself because it's pouring out. So you're not thinking infection, you're thinking, right, get pressure on that wound. You've got to stop that bleeding because if the blood's coming out the body, it's not going around the body, which means oxygen's not going around the body, which is obviously uh, bad news. So, Yeah, yeah, that makes complete sense. And a, a question came into mind a moment ago. It's actually, are there any occasions when we shouldn't jump in are there times we should actually just stand back are there any particular circumstances it's best not to do anything so the mnemonic which is the backbone of all first aid is dr abc if you're familiar with that one um and it's the order of actions the order of priorities in any first aid incident so d has to come first and d is danger so if it is not safe for you to approach please don't um you can still you know call 999 from standing back keeping yourself safe if whatever has got them gets you then you can't help them um so if they're holding a um a live electrical cable for instance just looking around my office and seeing cables everywhere um then you know if they are having electric shock you spasm you can't let go and so they will be stuck to it and that current, you know, potentially is going through their body to earth. If you then go and touch them, then potentially you are then stuck. So always checking for the hazards, um, minimizing any dangers to you, minimizing any dangers to anybody else around. Um, so actually, before you go and see the casualty, clearing everybody else away um, so that you don't end up with multiple casualties, you know, that's always important as well. Um, so, you know, in that situation, yes, I would approach, but once I've made it safe, there's, um, five hazards that we can't control, um, fire, uh, water, um, smoke, collapsing structures, we call it. So whether that's, you know, trees or buildings or whatever falling down. And the last one is big traffic as in, you know, fast moving traffic. Do not think I can stop the M25, you know, it's got to be, um, you've got to be aware of what you can do and what you can't. So that would be my yeah, main answer to that is until it's safe, don't jump in. Yeah, be aware of the dangers. I guess that's the first thing to, that anyone can hopefully, hopefully spot within a scenario. I, I want to kind of hop back into your past just because of some of the other conversations I've had, I'd love to just bring it up. What was your favourite expeditions that you were part of? <laughs> <laughs> so I've already mentioned I love the charity ones. Um, that sense of, so all the people who sign up to do an expedition while raising money for charity um, will have a very powerful story about why they are supporting that charity. So the bond that is instantly formed between those group members is amazing because they are very open and they will share, you know, their, their reason. And so it's not like when you go on a group holiday and everybody gets very selfish. Oh, I want the best room. I want the, 
I, whatever. Um, so they become this little sort of team that all support each other. And, um, you know, when someone's getting altitude sickness or when someone's, um, I don't know, just feeling a bit off with, I don't know, got diarrhea or something because they've eaten something, um, everybody just helps. Everybody wants everybody to achieve the challenge, basically. And so, um, you know, once my sort of first couple of years of the excitement of the world sort of to calm down a bit, my best trips were the ones that had the best groups. So, you know, some of the locations that I went to were absolutely amazing, but I had, you know, a horrendous group that I was really struggling with. And so, you know, you could be anywhere in the world, it didn't matter. Um, so just a couple to mention that I adored. I had, um, I did a cycle trip from, um, it was Saigon to Angkor Wat. So up through the Mekong Delta, all the way up through um, Vietnam, and then ending up in, in Cambodia. And that was just one of my best groups. They were so much fun. They were really up for it, you know, all ages, shapes, sizes. Um, and they just, I, I loved it. It was about, I think it was two and a half weeks. And I just remember it because every evening, you know, we'd done this big long cycle, we'd get to the next destination. We sit down, have a beer, congratulate each other. It's just that lovely camaraderie. It was just wonderful. Um, in terms of another one that actually wasn't so much about the group, but sort of sticks in, in my mind, was a um, horse riding trip across the Andes. I love horse riding. I love the Andes. <laughs> it's one of my favorite mountain ranges. Um, and it was Argentina to Chile, so lots of Argentinian gap shows. You know, really fun um, you know, team of, uh, of staff with us. And I ended up doing that one four times because I loved it so much. So I had four different groups. Um, but just to be right up in the hills, you know, riding these gorgeous horses, um, just, yeah, loved it. I'd go back and do it again, but I have small children now and I think my husband might complain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was going to be my next question. Do you have anywhere left or any challenges that one day perhaps in the future when, you're, when your kids are older that you still want to... Oh, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds. <laughs> um, my husband is very similar to me in terms of um, having done lots of wonderful adventures and trips and challenges and so before we had children you know we were not a sort of lie on the beach kind of couple um, you know we had a wonderful trip around Patagonia we had a wonderful trip around British Columbia you know we sort of go and explore and so we've started doing that a bit now um, with the kids. We did actually have a big trip planned for this summer, but anyway, another conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> like everybody's uh, plans, they've rather been yeah, delayed maybe to next yeah. year. Um, but we're getting them into, um, you know, doing some adventurous activities and things. And so, yeah, they won't have any choice. They will be <laughs> family holidays. Come on, kids, off we go. We're going to go and explore. And um, there's a lot of the world still to be explored, always. So I love it. What, yes. what would you say was your own biggest personal challenge that you've done so far? Oh, good one. Um, what, in the expedition world? Or, you know, mm -hmm. I think the challenge of actually, um, you know, having children is uh, <laughs> yeah. fair, fairly major. <laughs> They're still alive, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I um, but in terms of my um, my trips, I um, had my birthday one year at the end of July um, in Tibet, and we were over five thousand meters above sea level for the whole day. And um, I did actually wake up that morning just feeling horrendous. And it was a school group, so I was very much still trying to be that. You know, everybody was feeling horrendous because of the altitude. You just do. Um, and so I was just trying to motivate everybody, keep everybody going while also feeling horrendous myself. And I did actually announce my birthday is cancelled until we get back down to Lhasa, which is still about three and a half thousand, but you can feel a bit normal. And, you know, we went to a wonderful yak steak restaurant, which was just delicious and had a beer. I was like, right, today is now my birthday instead. <laughs> so, um, you know, the challenge of actually still being able to lead a group, motivate a group, keep everybody going, um, keep everybody safe when you're not feeling tip top. Um, you know, else you don't sleep very well as well. And I am, I'm an eight hours a night girl. Um, if I, 
if I'm short on sleep, I'm, I'm not, not great. And so I think that sort of challenge of going, I'm in a leadership role. This is, you know, everybody's relying on me. I've got to keep going. Um, even, you know, other trips, I did a Sahara trek and the whole group, there was dodgy meat, I think on the first night, the whole group got ill, some quite seriously. And um, I, you still have to keep going regardless. And um, I think that's probably the most challenging from those days. Yeah. Do you have a favourite continent? I'm guessing you've been to most of them, if not all. Um, South America, I think, is where um, my, you know, heart lies, as it were. I can speak Spanish. I love the locals. I love the Andes. Um, I, I love the food. Actually, a lot of the destinations, how much I love them was determined by how much I like the food. And that sounds really bizarre, but if you're spending many months in the same place, I fell out of love with China, sadly, quite quickly, because Chinese food in this country has been um, sort of changed for British palates. Whereas, you know, you go and have Peking duck in Beijing and it's very fatty and it's very lots of, there's not a lot of meat and the sauce isn't very, yeah, got a bit bored of it. Not, not for you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the food, the people, um, how much I can actually interact as well. So obviously I can't speak Chinese. So um, I, to get the most out of it, you want to be able to interact with the locals and, um, you know, get more out of the culture. And just the stunning scenery, you just can't beat it. You know, it's just amazing. I think you've inspired us all to go, go traveling. <laughs> But do a first aid course before you go because, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, well, it's interestingly, fun. actually, I imagine it's even more important, not just by the nature of you might be doing something adventurous, but also it may be more difficult to communicate if you do come up with any issues. If you can deal with things yourself, I guess that's going to be a little bit easier, at least to start with. Mm. And also, um, you know, we are so lucky in this country to have our NHS system, to have our, you know, a &E hospitals, etc. And so, you know, naturally, if you're going to a less developed country, um, those facilities, um, they can have some excellent facilities, but they might only be in the major cities. And, you know, if you're out trekking, um, it's going to be harder to come by. And, you know, the rescue services and all of that. So, uh, look, you know, being able to look after yourselves. Um, and, you know, if your body's not used to the, the food um, and, you know, you have purified your water correctly, you know, you might well be getting tummy troubles. Um, and so having, I teach this course, I just call it a travel wise course. And it's just talking a bit about, um, you know, if you get, I don't know, bitten by steak, if you get um, diarrhea, if you get um, heat exhaustion and all the sort of things that as, you know, British people, we, I'm not so familiar with and our, our bodies aren't so used to coping with then um it's worth having a bit of an a bit of a clue about that too excellent i was just literally about to ask you that the travel wise course excellent i think uh, everyone could do with that <laughs> well if we do it so say a, a lot to um like teenagers going off on gap years and going going traveling at you know that kind of age yeah. and um also you know yeah university students have long summer holidays oh let's go traveling yeah. Let's go do something um, adventurous. And I totally encourage that. Yes, off you go. You know, go have fun. But can I just spend a couple of hours you before just chatting through a few things? And also, yeah. you know, about being pickpocketed and, you know, some safety things as well and making sure you've got right insurance and, um, yeah, just being sensible. Well, it's perfect, isn't it? Because you they really are going to learn from your experience. And there's so many things that you wouldn't even think about you can pack it all into a couple of hours and you can go go off feeling so much more prepared exactly and that's that's not a cpr course that's more of a yeah, yeah. you're off to you know africa and please don't just drink the water uh, be sensible kind of. yeah well, that sounds great um, i mean i'm guessing as you're a bit of an adventurer are you are you keen on your own health and fitness and and have you got a healthy lifestyle do you have any priorities that you put in place for yourself and your family very much so. Um, I'm not a, you know, health and fitness 
extreme, but um, in terms of I do a couple of um, exercise classes a week, we have a, a very waggly sprinter spaniel who, um, if she doesn't get a good walk every day, uh, will be, yeah, will let us know. Um, and so, you know, that's always a very good way of, right kids, we've got to go and walk the dog, as opposed to, right kids, we've got to go for a walk, because then they kind of go, mm -hmm. um, So getting them out and about, you know, through lockdown, it's wonderful. It's like, right, you know, our daily outing, off we go. Um, and in terms of, you know, of diet, my mum was a cookery teacher, so she's always taught us to cook from scratch um, and have a, you know, fridge full of um, have vegetables and things. So we, again, in lockdown, got a, you know, fruit and veg box delivery, like I'm sure a lot of people did. And it actually brought create out of it you know when the third swede or cabbage appeared in the you know in a week <laughs> in a row and I was like okay we made love soups um you know got the kids eating love soups and um you know the, the good old baking like everybody does you know let's uh, throw an apple in there and a banana cake in there or whatever um and so yes I'm not as I said at one extreme but I hope to have a nice healthy middle road for, for me and my family yeah, wonderful. It sounds good. And this is always quite a big question and you can, you can answer it in a very uh, professional manner or you can do it as just a general thing for your life. They may cross over, but what inspires you? Um, lots of things um, in terms of professionally. Um, I love seeing the change in people from when they start a course and they're in that whole, I'm just, I know I'm going to panic. Um, I, I'm too scared of doing the wrong thing. And if I do the wrong thing, I'm going to get sued. And it's, it's all just, there's just so much. And it's not, you know, that kind of thing. Um, to hopefully when they finish a course and I'm like, how do you feel now? Um, it's just that, it's that confidence I keep coming back to, um, just going, yeah, I could do this. Yes. You know, I could step forward. Actually, it is a lot of common sense. And I love it when I read, you know, my reviews and testimonials and things, you know, on Facebook, Google, whatever. And a lot of them mention that it's more a feeling. It's not, um, you know, it's like Louise taught us all this stuff and it was, you know, it was fun, but it was memorable it i now feel um you know more confident that i could act appropriately or something like that and so that is my um, sort of professional reason for doing what i do i had a um, amazing story um shared um through messenger the other day uh, which i then shared on my social media and it was a lady who you know i've never met nothing she lives in florida she was in a um, steak restaurant and she was choking and you know the friends she was with didn't know what to do and she um you know was obviously completely panicking and this lady from the other side of the restaurant got up came over and you know gave her first aid and it cleared and said and you know her final line was and the reason i'm messaging you is this wonderful lady she was called stacy and you talked to her and she saved my life and that was just like wow amazing um and that was yeah this lady obviously was on holiday or something living in florida because i haven't been there to teach course and so you know in terms of inspiring definitely um personally i i'm lucky i have a lovely family i have a wonderful friends and you know i see my self with people who um have a strong sort of sense of purpose. Um, I'm not very good with people who sort of really do anything with their days. You know, I like, I mean, you know, where we met the Business Women In um, community, there's some amazing women there um, who are just living their passion. You know, they've turned it to a business and they are just out there doing it day in, day out with such, you know, enthusiasm. Um, it takes quite a lot of guts to actually set up your own business. Um, and so quite a lot of drive and, you know, when things go wrong, um, how do you get through it? You know, lockdown has been 
a shock for all of us. You know, we, when we were chatting and saying going online, you know, I had three months of not teaching and therefore, you know, three months of my business not doing anything. How do you come out of that? So, um, yeah, that inspires me. You know, other people's stories, you know, family, neighbors, friends, people who live each day um, with a question, you know, doing something for themselves. That inspires me. I love it. <laughs> it's really, really wonderful. And I'd like to sort of start bringing this to a close by giving you the floor to share one thing that you think everyone would benefit from knowing. That you can be a fabulous first aider with zero knowledge and skills, just by stepping forward, being willing to go and help. You don't need to know anything. If you, as I said earlier, you know, if all you do is emotional care, just be human, you stay with them, you talk to them, you have no idea what's wrong with them, helps on its way, you just be that person who is there as opposed to the person who walks on by, that is still fabulous first aid. You could save their life without knowing anything. That was lovely. I really like that. And, and you know, just a few weeks ago, um, we witnessed a motorbike accident and that exact same thing. And luckily he, well, he had a broken bone, but he was okay. It was, it was as, as well as it could have, have finished, but we were most shocked by how many people just wanted to go. And actually we just, we just had to wait until his wife came and, and the um, emergency services came, but people, I'm not sure whether, do you think a lot of it's fear? Do you think people don't want to get involved for fear of doing the wrong thing or just thinking they don't know what to do so they'll just stay away? Do you think that's a big part of it? There are a lot of fears of first aid. Um, so doing the wrong thing and getting sued, sadly, is a fear. Um, luckily in this country, we have the Good Samaritan Act that protects us from being sued. Um, there's the fear of seeing something they don't want to see. So, you know, motorbike accidents can be really quite messy. Um, and so they're like, oh, I don't want to do that. Um, but also, sadly, the fear that if they get involved, then, then that's their day completely messed up because they might have to stay there for a few hours. They might have to, you know, wait for no services. They might have to do a witch report and something like, oh, but I've got, a, you know, we're all so busy. You know, I've got an appointment here. I need to get back to this. I need to, you know. And so um, it might only be, I don't know how long you were, you know, there, but it might be. About an hour. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, but they're okay. And, and that's great. So, all fear of getting infected, that's another one, you know, sadly, if it's a stranger um, and you're like, well, there's lots of bodily fluids, you know, don't want to touch that or oh, haven't got any gloves. Well, as I'm saying, get the dog poop bag out of your pocket, whatever yeah. you've got, you know, get the sandwich bag. Um, so there are a lot of fears around it. Um, yeah. But we so can help just by being there. But you don't need to touch them. You don't need to be doing anything. Just talk to them and, um, and just be, be willing to help. So if someone else is taking charge, they need other pairs of hands, right? You call um, merge services, you, you know, clear the area of all the other people. Um, you, I don't know, talk to them and find out any past medical histories. You know, if I was in charge, I would need a few people to help me. And so being that person who says, yeah, I, what can I do? That's also wonderful. That's brilliant. Thank you. And um, I now would like to just, uh, get all the information from you how can we find you on the internet if people are further afield perhaps following you on social media and if they are in the reasonably local vicinity how could they find out about your courses so my business is worsley training um which is you know my surname and what i do um i'm based in Uphaven, which is in the middle of wiltshire and um I run public courses sort of around Wiltshire and West Berkshire. Um, so I did a course in Hungerford uh, a couple of weeks ago. My next ones are in September in Pusey. Um, all of that information is on my website, which is just worsleytraining.co.uk. And also I post um, almost daily on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn as Worsley Training. Um, a lot of that is top tips and reminders actually, you know, content that is useful um but i also 
advertise my um, public courses on there as well. Um, I am on Instagram, I am on Twitter, I just don't post as frequently on those, but there's still still things being shared. So whichever your social media platform is um, of choice, then you can find me on there. Um, so the public groups, that's public groups, the private groups um, that I run, um, I stay about an hour and a half from my bed is uh, is my area. So that definitely is all of Wiltshire, but also the edges of all the um, surrounding counties as well. So um, if you want me to come and teach in your school, if you want me to come and teach in your uh, business, then um, get a group together. If you want me to go up and teach in your, your home, you know, if it's a bunch of new parents, if it's a, um, I did a community, they had a new uh, defibrillator um, installed on the village hall and uh, it's like can you just come and show us how to use it I was like yes of course I can so getting a little group together um, then I will come to you for that brilliant thank you very much I will pop a link to all of those things onto the show notes so people can um, click straight through thank you so much for your time today I didn't even know about your expedition day so that was fascinating and I am sure there are things that we can all take home and remember from this conversation so thank you so much for your time not at all. Thank you for inviting me. It's been lovely. <laughs> Always good to chat. It is. It's great, isn't it? It's the best way of getting information as well, I think. It's just nice to have a conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to episode 21 of the Live Fit Now podcast. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Louise as much as I did. I know I've taken some tips home and I hope you have too. It would be wonderful if you could share this conversation with your family and friends. I think there is something that each and every one of us can hopefully remember in the future when we need it. So don't forget you can share on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. You can head over to the website, YouTube or email me directly. Hello at livefitnow.co.uk Thanks again for listening. Until next Thursday.